you know, Get a Grip on Lighting, Restoring Darkness, the Lighting Controls podcast, all these pr- shows we produce here at Get a Grip Studios, there seems to be a real European flair. And on this show, again, we have a, another one of our European colleagues coming on the show along with, his name is Peter Six and uh, Dr. Mike Krams. And uh, Peter's over in the Netherlands, I believe. But yeah, we got Germans taking over the uh, the the, uh, the darkness show, and now we got a Dutch guy taking over the Get a Grip on Lighting podcast. What's happening here? It looks like English is <laughs> gotta, becoming the lingua. Fr- you got to prepare. <laughs> um, it looks like English is becoming the lingua franca over in Europe. Everyone's talking about lighting in English, but let's talk about Peter Six first. He is well versed in the world of lighting and is passionate about the development and disruption of the new of new lighting innovations. Before joining Cibero. In 2020, he worked as Chief Commercial Officer for Ellipse Smart Solutions, a scale-up company in the field of data communication via light, Li-Fi. We've talked about a lot, that a lot on the Get a Grip Online podcast. Before that, he worked roughly 10 years in the banking industry in Europe and Asia. His main purpose at Seaboro is to bring the beautiful new technologies developed by the talented team to the market. To transform Seaboro from a pure R&D company to a technology business partner for the lighting industry. Peter has a breadth of experience in marketing, communication, and sales at corporate institutions and startups. You can find his LinkedIn and uh, cbro.com website on the Get a Grip on Lighting.com website. And of course, Dr. Mike Krames has more than 25 years of materials, device, and applications experience with emphasis on solid state lighting devices and products, including advancing the performance and color quality of LEDs for general illumination. He is currently president of. Arkeso LLC, a consulting firm in Silicon Valley, and a senior advisor to Seaboro Research BV in Amsterdam. Um, that's in the Netherlands, by the way. Dr. Krames' previously <coughs> previous roles, excuse me, <coughs> include Chief Technology Officer of Sora Inc. Never heard of those guys, and <laughs> Executive Vice President of Advanced Laboratories at Philips LumiLeds. Dr. Krames has over a hundred publications and has been granted over two hundred. That's right, 200 patents worldwide. He is a fellow member of both IEEE and IES. Again, his LinkedIn is on the Get a Grip on Lighting podcast website. And you can go, I hope I'm pronouncing this right, arkeso.com. That's A-R-K-E-S-S-O.com. Greg Garrick. But you know what? That's a long intro. So we're going to get to the podcast in a second here, folks. But we got to tell you about the craziest folks in lighting before we go there. TCPI.com. Greg Garrick. That's right, and they've got their Ultima T8 tube with emergency backup. I recently used it on a project. We're doing LED fixtures, and then they had a stairway that had a little wrap fixture, and they wanted to have emergency backup built in it. So I could either got emergency battery backup ballast and put a little kit in it, or I could have just retrofitted it to the LED tubes from TCP, and that's what I did, the Ultima T8 LED tube. It has the emergency battery built into the tube itself, and has a self-indicated uh, button on it that you can press and test it. And a uh, 90-minute backup power right from an LED tube. Nice system. Ooh, and we love our friends Ellis Yan and the peeps down at TCPI.com. Check them out, of course. Proud members of the National Association of Innovative Lighting Distributors. That's right. If you're a lighting distributor, join us, folks, because this is association is on the move. Greg Eric, let's open up the show finally. That's a long intro. That's a long intro, but you guys have a lot of history. So, and, and that's what I want to start with is the history because I was looking at it, Dr. Carms, you, 1995 in LED. Was there even an LED then? I know there was, but. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, yeah. It's, uh, it. uh, it's Dr. Krames. Thank you. And by the way, guys, I, I am based in Silicon Valley. So uh, I have strong connections to Europe as Peter will uh, attest to, uh, but I'm based here in California and uh, we work together. A uh, lot of travel involved, especially before uh the COVID situation a little bit less now, but it's starting back up. Um, yeah. So in 1995, uh, you guys knew LEDs because they told you your clock radio was on. You remember when mm. we had those, mm-hmm. uh, you know, your alarm clock and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So, um, but there were uh, some inventions at that time, two critical ones. Uh, one was the blue LED out of Japan mm-hmm. by Shuji Nakamura. Um, that was the missing link for white light from LEDs because we had green and red LEDs at that time. And there was also uh, an invention at Hewlett Packard here in, in San Jose, California, to make a fully transparent uh, uh, LED, a red LED that surpassed the efficacy of an incandescent tungsten bulb for the first time. And I think that was in 94 uh, when that was showcased by Hewlett Packard. Um, 
and HP, uh, and I think it was actually Philips reached out to them and said, hey, <laughs> if we have red, green, and blue LEDs, and there's no fundamental in limit to the efficiency, which is true on paper anyway with LEDs, lighting is going to change dramatically. And we need to have a conversation about that. And long story short, Phillips and Hila Packard formed a joint venture um, called LumiLeds. Uh, even back, I think that was the first one was formed in 1996. Um, a little outfit uh, that started up in Best, the Netherlands, to make traffic balls based on high power LEDs. So the paradigm shift that needed to happen at that time was we needed to go away from an LED that's just bright enough so that you can see it to one that's bright enough you get, that it can illuminate something. So we had to go from a few tens mm -hmm. to 100 milliwatts up to watts of power. Mm -hmm. So uh, I tell people, which I think is true, uh, when I joined Hewlett Packard Opt Electronics Division, I was the first engineer to work specifically and solely on watt class LEDs. And we started on the red, we moved uh, to the blue and green system and the nitrides. And eventually that joint venture swallowed up the entire uh, San Jose side of, of HP, HP, became the broader, the bigger LumiLeds uh, JV that was formed in 2000 that most people know. Uh, of and still exist today. Hmm. At what at what point did you guys see that you know the LED is going to hit the general lighting market? Well, you know it's interesting when you talk to the early folks like me. Um, we always had this vision because we knew, you know, the physics told you that there was no reason we couldn't wipe out everything, and we got laughed at a lot, mm -hmm. frankly, mm -hmm. um, because as you guys know, it wasn't really until what twenty ten. Or so that we started to see 2015 it really started taking off 2014 2015 yeah. it really started taking off yeah. yeah and so so those of us who were in it though had been in it by then for 20 years okay so in a, in a way it's like watching a slow moving kind of okay this is inevitable kind of thing and we, in the early days we had to deal with a lot of you know guffaws and stuff but over time those attitudes shifted from a ones of yeah is this can they be serious to what do I need to do about this? Because this is coming kind of thing. It was fun to watch. You know, I, I've often advocated that the lighting industry is the most disrupted industry more than even because I, I don't think uh, cell phones disrupted anything. I think they created a new industry with smartphones, something that didn't exist before. And um, and so they may have done their disruption piece to taxis but or whatever, um, social media or something like that. But in terms of an existing industry with the capital investment that lighting had in the world, I don't think there's any industry that's been more um, dismantled and disrupted. Has it worked out the way you thought, Dr. Krames? Um, interesting question. I, For most of us, and me included, it took longer than I thought. And I think one of the topics we want to talk about today is, <laughs> is retrofit linear tubes, which you think, you know, why, why is this a problem? Uh, but it turns out it's quite complicated. Um, and uh, yeah, so, especially in the early days, we did not appreciate all the nuances of all of the different things that would have to be developed and brought together to offer, you know, solutions that people could easily use. And I think that's probably normal in any in industry because it's not just the LEDs, it's the driver electronics, it's distribution, it's, it's reliability uh, of things that have nothing to do with the LED. Um, you know, a lot of things have to come together to fully disrupt the industry. So it took, and, and maybe this is why it also takes longer uh, to mm -hmm. do because a lot of things have, have to uh, happen. Um, as an analogy, you guys have probably heard and maybe talked about, you know, micro LEDs for displays. The idea mm -hmm. that instead of having a display, which is a, you know, a backlight and a filter, which is very inefficient, which is probably what you're looking at right now, we, you're entitled to have an emissive pixel that's extremely efficient. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, people have been working on that, including Apple, for coming up on 10 years since we still don't have those products in the market. Mm -hmm. The problem uh, I would submit it's not with the LEDs themselves, but it's all the integration stuff because it's so disruptive. As you pointed out, Greg, it just changes everything. So the entire mm -hmm. stack, the entire supply chain, the entire product development process, everything goes out the window. You have to start from scratch and you have to take care of so many things as you get towards the final product development and release that it just takes a long time. I love Chinese literature and I read this, but I have to read it in English, but, uh, um, 
I, there was this one philosophy in Chinese literature. It's called slow, slow, fast, fast. And what happens is most changes start really, really, really slow. And they go slow again. They start, they think you're going to take off. It's slow, slow, fast, fast. I think we're in the second fast right now. And um, my question to you is, uh, is, it, is this the normal process of disruption where you have this period of time where there's an invention, it finds a place in the market, you find manufacturers, people start to make it, um, incentives come into the market, whether they be from utilities or whether they just be people want to be a part of this technology or whatever happens. And, and then um, all of a sudden we make a whole bunch of mistakes. Like if you were looking at uh, iPhones, you'd say maybe we shouldn't have done social media. Maybe, <laughs> maybe, or maybe we could have done it a lot better. Like, it, or this is actually causing all manner of problems. Um, and we don't know how to get out of this mess. LED is in a big mess right now. There's a lot of problems with LED, light pollution, flicker. Um, and there's other issues that the, it, the industry is kind of taking its head out of the, out of the sand right now. But is there, is there any other way to do it other than to just start doing it and fix the mistakes as you go along? Well, I, yeah, I, I certainly don't know what the answer is, but I can give you my, my personal opinion. Personal opinion I think, yeah. yeah, my personal, you know, it's impossible to predict everything. Uh, for example, <laughs> and, and you hit on one that's really close to my heart, uh, the, the light pollution uh, mm. aspect. LEDs are fundamentally easier to control the light distribution pattern compared to any light source we've ever had in the history of light sources, simply because their brightness is higher. Um, but because their brightness is higher, the eton dew is smaller, you can control the light better. So we should have less light pollution. The fact that we don't, I think, is uh, a travesty. I, I think, you know, that was obviously not, not something that anybody was thinking about when they went through their product development process. They thought of, about return on investment, energy savings, maybe only dollars, but not that critical aspect. So uh, these points of value need to be brought into the product development process and if they were we would have less light pollution with leds compared yeah, to but you're, you're also forgetting period. about you're also forgetting about good old javon and his paradox right which is where we are right now is that the the cheaper something becomes the more of it we use and um you know i wouldn't say that light pollution hasn't been reduced i would say light pollution has been increased by a magnitude um, so it's all the other way around. So we've actually made the problem significantly worse with LEDs. Um, and, and, and I mean, there are societal benefits to energy efficiency that we have to weigh against that. And then we have to, but now I think you're right. It's not an engineering issue. It's not a research and development issue. We have all of the technology we need to re like not eliminate light pollution, but certainly have responsible outdoor light at night. And yeah, we, I mean, we, and we haven't, if I may interject, we have not created 10 times more light points with LEDs. That hasn't happened. We're basically replacing lights on poles that, that have existed. Uh, what has happened is that the product design process has not uh, basically made it a priority. You know that no one can measure that. Light. Eh? You know that no one and, can measure that. It's not, we, um, we don't have, we don't have any measurements for light pollution. So uh, there's... there there are studies. There are ways to do that. I mean, satellites have been used to do that. The DOE has had studies. The, satel the satellites pollution. can't. The satellites can't read above three thousand Kelvin. And certainly, uh, lighting uh, product manufacturers can measure up light and radiation patterns. It's not difficult. The other aspect, and I think this is fair. Um, the LEDs have more of their light in the blue spectrum, even for warm white LEDs, than we might have for a you know high pressure uh, sodium lamp, for example. Mm. Um, and there's more scatter uh, of that light. And so that, that is something uh, that is, uh, does create more up light. But that is also addressable with LEDs. You look at the mm -hmm. Nichia uh, lamp out there. They have this uh, beautiful golden uh, LED whose product name escapes me at this uh, moment. It's just a matter of choice. It, they choose a particular phosphor, a certain uh, design uh, in terms of residual blue, blue, uh, leaked blue light to have a beautiful golden glow. Uh, these things are completely solvable, but you have to care <laughs> whether it's policy driven or whatever. And, and I don't accept that you can't measure it. You absolutely can measure it, Greg. I mean, these, but uh, Michael, but, care, but, right? but no, no, the, uh, oh, but the, uh, that's okay. The, um, uh, they can't measure it. They can measure it individually, but there's no metric. There's no standard metric and the satellites don't measure above 3000 Kelvin. So they're only measuring the HPS. 
They're not measuring the LED light. And I would push back at you that maybe it's not 10,000 times, but it's a hell of a lot more. How's that? And uh, there's no way that there isn't less light pollution. But I think we've gone off into a little bit of a, a diversion here. <laughs> Let, let's take it over to Peter. Peter, um, where, where does Seaboro fit into all this? Um, in your mind and, and what, we're t- what we're talking about. And then we'll throw it back over to Dr. Krems. Yeah, well, Seabro C- fits perfectly well into uh, creating a company with technologies which benefit for the, the world uh, and um, creating more uh, sustainable products, sustainable technologies. And that's actually what we are doing at Seabro. It's a company that's uh, roughly 10 years old, um, and um, uh, we are backed with a private uh, equity company called Momentum Capital, who really believe in the things that we are doing. Um, we are structured basically in three different programs, uh, of one which uh, is uh, the Ultima, that's, that's one. And the other two are, like Mike just mentioned, in, in the material side, so creating basically the, uh, the ultimate layer of phosphor, uh, hopefully creating an, an additional 20% of energy savings. That's basically our ultimate goal with this program. And the third program is more into the health, um, healthy lighting. So uh, a solution for human-centric lighting, where we see that the whole market is talking about human-centric lighting on mm-hmm. dimming and, and color, uh, color control, basically, yeah? uh, combining it with our uh, biorhythm, so the, uh, the circadian rhythm. What we are doing there is something sp- very different. Uh, we call it uh, human centric like 2.0, uh, based on the technology or the effect of photobiomodulation. Uh, so that d- three different programs, three different uh, very bright people here working at uh, at Cipro, um, and a team of uh, roughly 35 uh, people here, uh, ten different back uh, uh, coming from ten different company uh, uh, countries. Uh, so a wide variety, and I think this is fantastic, like a melting pot of, of, of young, bright minds working on these uh, innovative uh, and sustainable technologies in lighting. Mm. And I think, coming back to your point, I think we for, fit perfectly there. Uh, it's an R&D company, uh, and I mean, I joined the, the team uh, two and a half years ago, uh, roughly, and they asked me basically to transform the company from a pure R&D player to, to more a business partner for lighting, uh, for the lighting industry. So, uh, so we, we, we are, yeah, sorry, Greg. You wanna ask? Oh, no. uh, I was just going to say, you, you mentioned the word sustainable and, and what does that mean to you? Because we've talked to a lot of people about it and, and it means different things to different yeah, yeah. people. So what is your meaning of sustainability? Or Seabrows? It's, it, it's it, in the three different programs that we have. Uh, it is uh, one of the checklists is it has to be sustainable. So in our in our mind, that is, it has to save additional energy, for example, compared to existing LED uh, lighting products or solutions out there. So looking at Ultima, where we get to uh, uh, later, it, it is very sustainable because you save a lot of material waste, for example, with a, with a perfect tube for tube uh, person, uh, avoiding basically to open up ceilings and get rid of the fixtures uh, it's not ne- it's not necessary so if you look at the studies from uh, NGOs like clasp how much uh, material waste is generated basically by the industry we think that's something we have to tackle and basically Ultima is one of the solutions that's out there available for all the market players uh, to use uh, so that is f- for example one of the sustainable uh, what I call sustainable solutions that we have. But for example, what also, it, oh, yeah. What? Oh, sorry. I'm just curious. The Ultima is kind of making me think. So, what is it different, or how is it different than the LED tubes that are out there right now? Well, there's a there's a huge difference in what we're doing with Ultima compared to what's out there. So, so I mean, we have to maybe get a little bit back from from how it all started in in Europe, and I mean, in in 2006. It's basically was already already in the uh, the Rose Directive, right? That uh, applicable products out there, electronic products, they have to uh, comply basically with the Rose Directive norms. That it was that they, they said, okay, get rid of these toxic uh, uh, substances in in the product, like like mercury or lead or uh, you know uh, cadmium or whatever. And uh, you see in the lighting industry, I mean. 
finally, uh, uh, it, it, it was a shift to LED uh, with sustain, more sustainable products. And um, looking at uh, the exception, basically uh, what happened for this uh, for the tube market, uh, there was there was already in 2006, there was something they said, OK, until 2016, we will accept an exception for these uh, fluorescent tubes because at the time they were quite high, uh, relatively high lumen per watt. So it was quite energy efficient. And they said, OK, let's keep those fluorescent tubes out there until 2016 and then we'll see how we uh, how we go. Right. And, and, and after that, OK, so the whole the whole lobby uh, started uh, around those years, uh, 2016 and st uh, around that, that the, that the lighting industry, uh, lighting Europe, for instance, in Europe, um, they were trying to really to keep this exemption in uh, because there was not a plug and play solution out there, as they quoted. Um, we don't think that's really uh, the case because at the time we were already building on the one led technology what we now call Ultima technology to basically control the power. Uh, we'll get the, into into that in a minute. Um, and so there was a plug and play solution already out there. The technology that we have in hand is 99% compatible. If you put it in sockets, it will turn on and it stays on. Uh, and that's basically what we what we call one TLED. Um, yeah, so uh, an Ultima is something basically new. So uh, the new uh, eco design uh, single lighting regulations basically define, um, uh, you know, the, the, that the determined value of, uh, of of power cannot exceed more than ten percent, right? And and uh, uh, and also the luminous uh, flux cannot. Oh, sorry, the luminous flux cannot be more than ten percent, and the power cannot be high uh, the, or five percent. And basically, what we have created with Ultima is a solution for that. So it's an adaptive power control solution. It creates basically a solution out there for the market, which is not available currently. Okay, before we before we get, I want to dig into. So you're actually controlling these LED tubes in some manner. That's what you're. You have a control system for them. Okay, I want to ask about that Absolutely. in one second. But yeah. can we can we state that the that the premise of sustainability is field repairability, like being able to repair a fixture in the field? If you can't do that then you're going to generate a lot of waste because there is going to be failures. Is that, is that one of the, or one of the premises of sustainability would be field repair? Dr. Cr um, Dr. Krams, what do you think of that? Uh, I think that's a reasonable uh, vector. I wouldn't say it's the only vector in sustainability, but this whole idea of modularity, I do. I do modularity, just, yeah. It just makes sense, right? Sure. Because uh, you see these beautiful integrated luminaires and uh, you see things, you know, put into furniture or building infrastructure and man, it looks nice, but <laughs> what if design changes, you know, seven mm. years from now and it's not fashionable anymore, mm -hmm. or there will be reliability issues or gee, the control systems have changed and now we do this. So I tend to agree that modularity is a, um, it just seems natural that we're going to need to do that. And that's one of the things that's a, kind of a driver behind Ultima as well, because uh, what, Ultima technology does is bring in the necessary power control to a retrofit LED tube that anyone can plug in. And to answer, you know, uh, the question you asked before, uh, Greg, you know, in, in a nutshell, what is Ultima? We we have found, okay, so with Sebra, we did a study in Western Europe. We went around construction uh, sites all over Western Europe, uh, dug up um, uh, luminaires that were getting exchanged out, the fluorescent luminaires, took out the ballast, the electronic ballast they had in there, took them back in the lab and, and did tests. With the commercially available tubes that you can go buy, top brands, I mean, who they are uh, in Europe. And turns out the power goes all over the place. A 24 watt, you know, 24 watt tube, rated tube can with uh, the various ballasts, and we dug up more than uh, 100 uh, that we tested, could vary from anywhere mm -hmm. to about half its drawn power to more than half. So imagine a 24 watt lamp that's drawing 45 watts when you plug it in. That can happen. Now you're talking and, about and, an and, LED or a fluorescent? No, I'm talking swapping out the LED, uh, the fluorescent, and putting in an LED tube. A commercially using the ballast, right? Using tube, the ballast, using ballast electronic compatible. ballast. Yeah, 
yeah. yes. using a ballast a linear tube. I'm talking about a linear tube with electronic ballast in Europe. Uh, if you plug this, those tubes that are available now, either uh, HF only or universal, the, the power is not guaranteed. And we measured it. And it so you're saying the energy the consumption place. exceeds the specification on the lamp because of the ballast and the ballast factors? And on average, yes. It, it, on average, it exceeds at more than 20%, which is um, an affront, uh, I think, to, mm -hmm. the, to sustainability. Um, and worse than that, it's dangerous. Uh, no, no, no product engineer designed a 24-watt lamp uh, for 40 watts, 25,000 hours, ever. Uh, so, so hang on, I just want to be, be clear about this. LED T LEDs that are type A, ballast compatible, okay, that may have a wattage uh, of 10 watts, 11 watts, 15 watts, 18 watts, whatever the wattage is. When they plug in, yeah. that wattage fluctuates all over the place because of the ballast. <laughs> Yes, a couple of things there. A little bit different than Europe than in the U.S. We don't have quite the power uh, gradations that you mentioned there. Um, and the retrofit tubes are either called uh, HF only for electronic ballast or universal, which, in which case they work with, with electronic and magnetic ballast. Yes, in our test, and we published this in MDPI Sustainability, <laughs> which is the, the word of the day, I guess, um, mm -hmm. just this summer uh, after presenting the results at the Light Sources Conference in Toulouse in June. Um, the, the spread in power is, is, is crazy. Uh, imagine, you know, going and purchasing a, a, an automobile and you're told, Hey, this guy's 30 miles per gallon. Um, but then, but it depends on what gas station you use it. You know, mm. maybe it's going to be 15. Maybe it's going to be, maybe it'll be better. Maybe it'll be 35 miles a gallon, mm. but it could be as low as 15. It's ridiculous, right? I can't think of any device, electronic device where you have no idea what power it's going to use when you install it and that's but the hang situation on, this is a european problem or do you think linear. it's the same problem in the united states and canada i, I think in the, in the u.s there are, uh it's a little bit mitigated by the fact that we do have these uh power level breakups into finer uh grades uh we have not done a study uh mm. in the u.s partly because of that but more uh i, I think more is just more urgent in Europe because we have a fluorescent ban. There is no ban in the U.S. I mean, California and Vermont are are, are moving in that direction, so we'll see. Um, but in the U.S., this is happening in September mm. of 2023. No more fluorescent lamps, right? So people are going to be forced to go to yeah. an LED solution. And the problem is that the retrofit the retrofit solutions that are out there today are disastrous. And what ultimately well, what's wrong with in in, in Go ahead. Greg. Sorry, with Sorry. bypassing the ballast. What's wrong with this bypassing the ballast? You, you can do that. Yeah. Uh, so in in, the, in Europe, that requires an electrician, and and it raises mm -hmm. questions about the certification. So unlike in the U.S., where yeah. if I understand correctly, you, uh, UL allows electricians to self-certify, and mm -hmm. there's usually rebates that one can use mm -hmm. to kind of justify the cost. These mm -hmm. do not exist in Europe. Certainly not everywhere in okay. Europe. So there's a huge barrier to end users. Yeah. And and why should they have to do that when they could? They should be able to go buy a tube and plug it in, for God's sakes. I mean, that, that, it, right? And the only difference in order to make that happen is to go from cheap passive electronics, which is what the, the big lighting companies are using today, to slightly more sophisticated, smart electronics, active power control electronics. And that's mm. what Ultima is. And that's what mm. Sebra has developed. And that technology is, a, is available broadly to the industry. So Sebra is a licensing company. Uh, we have a full portfolio of patents and technology, documents, brochures, mm -hmm. reference designs to help uh, customers get on uh, the market. And, and uh, we, as Peter can tell you, we talked to the big guys and, and Peter, we're actively involved with the company in Germany right now, uh, putting Ultipa into uh, products, right? Yeah, absolutely. So, so we are working with a, a fantastic company called uh, Aurora Lichtwerk, which is basically a carve of uh, carve out a factory of uh, of Osram, and these guys are uh, are basically building a new site uh, production and development site, bringing these products to the market, and they uh, they are one of our licensees basically. So uh, we have uh, an agreement with them. They uh, make they basically uh, implement our technology inside their uh, designs, their tube designs and offer to the market or direct, or they're going to work together with the bigger players out there in the market, uh, the bigger brands. Uh, and of course, indeed, as Mike says, uh, we are also talking, uh, to, talking to them about Ultima and also our other technologies. 
quick question before so, we – I want to ask a couple – I just want to clear something up before I lose track of it in the conversation. So you guys have committed to existing lamp shapes. So traditional lamp, legacy T8, T5, those lamp shapes as the technology to move forward with. Or yeah. is it a combination? Do you guys see that there is going to be these existing lamp shapes that we're going to use for retrofit and moving forward, we're going to develop new form factors that we're going to standardize so that our, our innovation can be... F- One of the problems with no boundaries, uh, Dr. Krames, is that a lot of innovation gets wasted in form factors. Like where are we going to put the, the LED array? And If we standardize those things, then more of the research and development goes into you know, light output or energy efficiency or control or these other things. And so if every manufacturer is making different form factors all the time, we lose those efficiencies. Um, Are we, do you think we're going to, are we going to, is, is the world, is the world going to say, we're sticking with existing lamp shapes. Let's move forward. Let's re get those metal benders going again, Greg Garrick, and put those sockets in there. Let's go with the medium bipin sockets and let's go. Or are we going to develop new form factors, Dr. Dr. Krams, and we're going to now standardize those and so that we can would not waste innovation on areas that it's not it's not going to help anybody. Yeah, I mean, very long term is kind of hard to answer, but but sure. short term, absolutely. Uh, we we have done all of our work to uh, to fit with the existing form factors and be super easy for people to use. So mm. standard T8, we have a T5 program. Um, so the idea is that the installer, the end, you, whoever's dealing with the lamp doesn't have to know anything. Sure, you just that's exactly. Pull out what the fluorescent yes. and put it in, and all of the, as you said, all the focus is in in our case is in the smart electronics and mm-hmm. how it works with. Uh, it's actually it's a beautiful technology. Instead of having one string string of LEDs, you have multiple strings of LEDs, and the electronics dithers between them in order to steer a voltage based on what the ballast is doing, so that it can control the power. That's how it so, works. So, is it talking to the ballast and the and the LED array? Like, is that a fair way to say yeah. it on the from a, yes. a yeah. colloquial perspective? So, tell Absolutely. me a little bit about how you guys like. So, you guys are are saying the the tube is saying, tell me what this ballast is doing, and then I will reconfigure that to do what the tube needs it to do. Right. Absolutely. It's a, it's a software driven, actually. So mm-hmm. we have a little algorithm uh, uh, on board, and uh, what happens is that there there are uh, multiple strings of LEDs, so at least two. So, so a typical, you know, tube will have a string of LEDs, and you take out, you know, the fluorescent lamp, and you put in the LEDs. Now the voltage, you know, drops by half, and the load goes from 150 ohms to, to three to five ohms. And the and the ballast, basically, which are most electronic ballasts, are designed around uh, a resonant topology where the the current it's a constant current source that depends on the load, and so it will frequency shift and just start mm-hmm. sending current. Mm-hmm. Okay, so now you got current. You can't really do much about the current, but you can do something about the voltage, and that's the beautiful thing of Ultima is to figure out how can we do something about the voltage, and we can do that by having multiple strings. And what happens is the circuit turns on the strings uh, either individually or in series, and then dithers those at very high frequency, 100 to 200 kilohertz, to basically have a blended, a virtual voltage. And it steers that vo- virtual virtual voltage uh, through this high frequency dithering until it gets the power that it needs. So dithering has become good. It used to be bad to dither, Greg. Um, well, <laughs> but, but hey. I mean, this is a bad term to use, but it's, you're switching at super high frequency we, uh, between the two. So, but and this allows um, you to blend. this this allows you to standardize the consumption and the light output. Is that what is that the yeah, end result? We, we blend the voltages of the of the the single or multiple strings to have a virtual voltage, uh, which helps the uh, device come back to its rated power. In a nutshell, does it still? It. It's very simple. Does it still depend on ballast factor? You have 0. 0.77, 0. 0.87, 1. 1.15 is at least in the U.S. Uh, I don't know what it is. Yeah, in, in Europe there is no such thing. So the mm. and, and that's partly again why the driver is you 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 have you know four foot two or, or five. Uh, I should say 1200 millimeter, 1500 millimeter. It has a certain wattage and uh, the, the lamp is, is expected to deliver basically that wattage. Uh, the European regulations for in eco design say that the, the lamp should produce no less than 10 percent below the rated lumen level and consume nor that no more than 5 percent above the rated power. The trick is 
what power are we talking about? Well, it's just kind of like we had in the U.S. with Energy Star with MR16 lamps. It's the declared value. Okay, so they decided what's the declared value? Well, that's if we hooked the tube up to mains, which you can't do anyway if there's electronic ballast. So, but you know the regulations can only do so much. They can't force a manufacturer to test with thousands of ballasts. But the the point is that um, there's a spirit of the regulation that we should the lighting design should be met and we shouldn't be wasting power. And we can do that. The ultimate technology does that. The existing uh, lamps that are out in the market today with cheap passive electronics do not. They're all over the place. It's a complete disaster. And do you think that is a play in the U.S. too in other markets, or do you think it's more focused Well, on you know, we're going to wait and see. I think uh, California okay. just signed in uh, this law uh, that, that, that swept in a mercury ban, I think, in 2024. I know Vermont is doing that too. Mm -hmm. We're going to watch that. Um, as I said before, things are a little bit different in Europe, with, uh, in, in the U.S., with these uh, graded power le levels and ballast factors, as you mentioned. Um, and there are also, uh, we need to look at UL and the rebate situation and all that. So we're, we're looking at the U.S. market. But guys in Europe, this is triage. I mean, we're, we're now less than one year away, <laughs> fluorescent yeah. lamps being banned. And it, there's going to be a huge onslaught. And if we don't fix this problem... There's going to be fires. There's going to be people that are unhappy and they're going to blame it just like air, the light pollution. They're going to blame it on LEDs. It has nothing to do with LEDs. OK, mm. they were going to blame it on LEDs. We're going to get all this pushback and people are going to use that argument to say, bring back good old mercury fluorescent. Well, what's what's the rush, though? That's whenever I hear about bands like I like I sell light. I go out here. I sell light bulbs every day. I sell thousands of mercury containing lamps i also recycle millions of mercury containing lamps so i'm the number one recycler in my jurisdiction for lamps okay i don't understand the um blanket bands they don't make any sense to me they're going to create a ton of waste okay because i'll give you an example <coughs> here's a um this is a product we did last week here's a uh, an under cabinet light from the same manufacturer one is fluorescent one is led okay and for those looking they have different plug connectors at the end okay same manufacturer okay this goes under a cabinet this goes under a cabinet this has a fluorescent tube this is an led array okay so now when this tube is no longer available you have to not only do you have to rip the fixture out but you have to rip the cabinet off the wall in order to change to this right because this plug doesn't fit with this with this with this uh, device and so i don't understand the, the the complete and total abandon of of we can do it incrementally and I, I think it would be much better served dr Krames, if these bands come to the u.s they already have them in california vermont i i think that they're crude um and i think there's going to be a ton of in, in unintended consequences and i think you could get you could probably get 99 percent out with saying let's take the top 15 SKUs, greg and ban those you know, like instead of banning blanket banning all fluorescent lamps, like why not why not ban um, F thirty two T eight eight forty one K? That would that would solve the problem. You know what I mean? Yeah, and I mean I think well, my in my opinion, I think in the, at the end of the day, you kind of end up that way anyway because there ends up being so many ex exemptions for you know decorative this, decorative that, you know, specialty lamp this, and specialty lamp that. That's I think why I'm saying in, no in exemptions, just ban. Like, let me tell you something. I have a I have a stock system here, which tracks the stock of all the major lighting distributors in in Canada. Okay, and so I know what they have in stock. You know what their number one item in stock is? F thirty two T eight. That's their number one item in stock. Buy, they have more of that in stock than the rest of, maybe the rest of their inventory combined, including LEDs and, and other incandescents and lamp shapes. Like one of my vendors has 112,000 F32 T8 841K, Greg. 112,000 of those lamps in stock. Hell right now, I just saw it this morning. That's Canada. That's yeah. Ontario. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, think about how many F32 T8 lamps there are out there, or F34 T12s. I mean, this idea that blanket ban everything across the board, it's so simple. There's only like 10 lamps you'd have to ban, and you leave the industry to do whatever they You don't need to make any exemptions. You just say, <clears throat> I'll tell you, I could, I could tell you right now, the top 10 lamps that you would need to ban, and I talked to the, I can't remember her name, but at the IEEE about this as well. It's like, 
you're creating, you're going to be, the idea of creating more garbage, like we can just ban, we can ban 15, 10 or 15 lamps, 400 watt metal halide. Bye bye. You know what I mean? Like that's got what, 15 or 25 milligrams of mercury. It's a mercury beast, 1000 watt metal halide. You know, these lamps have massive amounts of mercury in them compared to fluorescent tubes even. And you could take 15, 20 SKUs and you just got rid of 99% of all the mercury in lighting. And you could leave the rest of the people for another 20 years to, to go through the cycle of, because these are gone. These are going to be gone at the next kitchen renovation cycle. 20 years, all of these will be gone. Um, <clears throat> so why, why the blanket ban? I, I, like, I don't understand that. Yeah, I, well, I think, uh, it, let's just say government policymakers don't have the expertise you have. Right. And so they, call and, and me. There's... Come on the get a grip on lamb. I'm here for everybody. <laughs> but let me ask you yeah. this. There's another another concern. So, but, I want to take. But, I wanna... Can, can I can I can I address sure. a couple of points about mm-hmm. that, though? Mm-hmm. I, you know, um, you're absolutely right. And the ban, you know, is going at it's 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 simple. It has to be relatively simple policy wise. Right. There are going to be a lot of exemptions, which are going to frankly do a little bit more of what you're talking about. But they are going to get the big guys, all of these uh, these T8 lamps. Why exempt? Get, yeah. Why exempt anything? Just ban the shit that's 99 percent of it. OK, fair enough. Like, um, why, why, why? They're going the wrong way. This is, they're going the wrong way. this is going to happen anyway because the, the big movers, the ones that consume the most volume, the most electronic waste, the most electricity, and the most mercury are going to get caught in the ban. And it's a climate catastrophe. Uh, we could already have saved millions of tons of mercury. And by the way, mm-hmm. recycling, we looked into the, the, the recycling statistics in Europe, and there are numbers on this, are horrible. And I don't believe they're better in North America. About 12%, I think, of lamps that are intended to be recycled actually get recycled. Oh. So most of that mercury is going into uh, into dumps, runoff, water. It's poisoning the earth. Okay, And we're also, we have, we're burning up twice as much power to light these fixtures mm. than we need to. There's a mm. huge energy payment. And we're talking about between now and 2030, class the organization that worked with uh, Sweden and also Cibero to push back on these endless exemptions on fluorescent lamps in mm-hmm. Europe uh, predicts like something like 40 terawatt uh, terawatt hours of, of, of savings could be had uh, 5 million tons of mercury, some huge number of uh, greenhouse gas emission uh, reductions. I said 40, I should say 140 terawatt hours. That number yeah. I remember. And I think it's 40, million metric tons of carbon emissions between 2020 when they were supposed to start and in 2030. So the the planet, we can do better and we need to do better. Okay. In the spec with the specter of climate change, uh, it's, it's unconscionable that we're not already on top of this. And if it needs to be a blanket wide ban, so be it, it needs to get done. And I, and I, and I'm glad to see the California Vermonter waking up to this problem. I hope the, the rest of the United States does too. And if we could do it more nuanced, that would be great. But I, I just don't think government works that way. So yeah, it's going to be messy and we're going to have to take our medicine and it's not going to be, you know, not everybody's going to like it. And the, mar- the market in Europe is huge, uh, guys. It, we're talking globally around 12 billion installed place, uh, base fluorescent tubes out there. 12 billion. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so if sure. you're going to ban that, that's huge. In Europe, we're talking about at least a billion. Uh, and uh, looking only at the, own, the last five years, we see that there have been around 800 million pieces of fluorescent tubes sold out there, which are going to be replaced in the upcoming years. So it's a, it's a huge potential, not only to ban this and also to get rid of this mercury, but also, as Mike, uh, Mike, uh, Dr. Crane said uh, uh, fairly, uh, the, the huge amount of energy savings we can do. 58 watts tube can be uh, uh, replaced by 23 watts tube. But you can't make that many tubes, can you? I mean, how are you guys going to, I mean, I, I, that, I mean, you guys got to open a fi- factory in China, brother. I mean, you got to give a call over no. to Shenzhen and yeah. say, hey, Michael, we need they, a billion tubes now. Yeah, they, yeah. They, the big guys a, got it, those factories. Uh, yeah. It's it's a yeah. matter of turning them on. I mean, it's so doable. It's a good problem to have. Uh, for yeah, them. for sure. We are we are as we said earlier. We are an R and D uh, provider, so we provide the technology mm. to the to the players in the market, like the biggest brands out there. You can name them, and we talk to them. So our purpose 
is basically to add the technology inside their portfolio. And they have their OEMs, their factories, whether it's in China, but we also see a, a strategic shift to Europe to manufacture in, in, in Europe uh, uh, light, lighting products. So this is where our partner Aurora comes in. It's great. It's made in Germany, uh, something different from, uh, from, uh, from the past. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I mean, it, it is a huge, huge market and the top it's dominated by the three, four biggest uh, companies out there. And well, basically our, uh, our purpose is to, to basically get inside them and uh, convince and them that they, they need to use Ultima. Yeah, and that, that's what's interesting about this whole thing is they used to do that. They used to do that yeah, themselves. Yeah, they used to do but that they themselves. They don't any yeah. longer. They don't have the mm, research yeah. teams. Yeah. They don't have this. So you guys are the ones doing it now for us. Is that interesting? <laughs> I think that's, well that, that brings yeah. us to this. I think that we're on the sweet spot indeed, as you say, Greg. I mean, they've cut down uh, a lot on the R&D departments mm -hmm. and also in the, the factory. I mean, quite a lot is outsourced to, uh, uh, well, basically to OEMs and manufacturing the products for them. Uh, and indeed, we see an increase of interest in our portfolio of technologies. And as, as Dr. Crane just mentioned, uh, the, the Mercury Bank kick, it will kick in, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Michael. It will kick in next year. Uh, uh, so, so the market has to be ready uh, to, to basically transform from fluorescent to LED. And the products out there of LED tubes uh, are basically not good enough, is, is our statement. Yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah. I have a, I have a, I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example. Ontario is like France. We're mostly nuclear energy. Okay. So Ontario is a wash and I think it's 60, 70, 80%, depending on how many of them are running at one particular time, but they can only use one lamp or the majority of their lamps are F40 T12 metric. Okay. So okay. I don't know if you've ever heard of that lamp. It was only ever in Canada. Okay. <laughs> Not me, a, sorry. A one meter long T12 fluorescent tube. Okay. Oh, I don't know, whatever it is. Okay, yeah. I don't know if it's a meter long. I used to have lots of stock on those, actually. Make a lot of money on those. Anybody got any metric lamps? Send them to me. <laughs> I got a customers for those metric lamps. But the problem is, like, they're concerned that the LED won't work in the environment of the, the in the nuclear environment. In the, in a, and that's their concern. Now, listen, listen. They can't change anything at those places, okay? Yeah. You turn a screw, I, it's three guys standing there watching him. I'm turning the screw 30 degrees. He's turning the through 30 degrees. He's turning the screw 30 degrees. That's how those places are run, okay? Like, it's serious. He's changing the light bulb. He's changing the light bulb. He's changing the light bulb. Document it. He changed the light bulb. Yeah. You know, that's how that place is. It's, it's wild. So, I mean, there is going to be interesting to come. I wanted to, uh, we could go, I feel like we could go longer. We're already 47 minutes. We'll go a little bit more, Greg. What do you think? Usually we try to cut yeah. it at, at 45, but this, I, I think we just opened a little bit here and we haven't even really started. My concern, regulation following innovation or innovation following regulation, right? Like Europe, Europe seems to lead the world in regulations, like. Brussels is the regulation capital of the world or whatever. You hear these sorts of things, right? And what, you, what I'm seeing here is, and I'm, this is a question. It's not a comment. We see innovation following regulation, right? So the, 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 the um, European says we're going to, uh, Europe says we're going to cut out mercury. We're cutting out fluorescent lamps. We're getting rid of metal halide. And you see you guys are innovating towards that. Which way should, is it a is it chicken or egg, Dr. Krams? How do we how do we do this better? Should 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 regulation be chasing the innovation, or should the innovate the regulators say make it like this and we innovate towards uh, that? What? Michael, you gave me a softball. We say, I mean, absolutely, innovation <laughs> drove this. We wouldn't even have this conversation if it wasn't for LEDs, white LEDs, and LED mm. lighting, the reliability. I mean, that's the whole reason we Good can point. have the conversation. So it's totally made that. Um, and then, and then I think there's this, uh, you mentioned there's different phases and, and there's this interesting phase where policy says, oh gosh, we've got to do something about this. And then because of the nuances of the policy to your point, which are not perfect, there can be additional, you know, innovation. And I, what I think was beautiful about the Sebra's ultimate technology, they've been thinking about this for a while and, and did the proactive work, right? With, with no government funding or anything, mm -hmm. you know, convinced their, their investors, hey, we need to do a field study in Europe and go dig up these luminaires and find out what kind mm -hmm. of ballast we have. Because we, you know, these compatibility lists that they have, you know, are ridiculous. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, that's not what's really in the buildings. Let's go get them. And that's what they did. So we went out there and got all this stuff, brought them in the lab. We have 
hundreds of ballots. Guys are in there testing, guys and, and gals in there testing for, you know, months, right, mm. to get all this data put together and we and, and realize the story. And and, uh, the, and and that's a kind of a new a, a nuance on the on the broader innovation. Hey, let's make sure we're ready for this application. And it turns out uh, something had to be done about that. And the beautiful thing is that the Seabird team came up with this idea mm. to just bring in active power control so we can do this application right so that people can go buy their standard form factor T8s, plug them in and they're going to work and they're going to deliver the rated power. It's as simple as that. Um, I think a lot of people say that, you know, the more simple the device is, the more hard work and innovation that went into it. Mm. In a way, that's kind of the situation here with these tubes, a true plug and play lamp that gives you the power that it's supposed to. It's hard to make, hmm. um, but that's what the application requires because the consumer and the planet deserve nothing less. You can't, we can't have situations where, you know, you put in a, a lamp and maybe it doesn't turn on, maybe it flickers, maybe it delivers half the light that you needed or twice the power it's rated. I mean, that's where we're at today and it's just completely unacceptable. Well, I love being wrong. Um, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Uh, no, no, it's just you're a right. comment. You're, no, no, right no wrong, you pointed right it out. It's absolutely right. Like if you didn't start this stuff in 1995, there could be no feasible regulation. And so maybe there is problems with it, like you said, but it's feasible and it's doable. And um, you guys are adding to that. Uh, Greg, what do you got, buddy? So uh, we have a whole nother angle we could go on this, but I think we need to do a part two, guys, because we don't want to overdo it. But the whole healthy lighting and research yeah. and all that. So I think yeah. we're going to tease the listeners and say, hey, we're going to do a part two as long as you guys are good with this. We'll schedule it for another time and get after that. Yeah, that was fun. I want to see that place where you do the testing on the ballasts. I'd love to go and see Amsterdam. that. It's here. It's here. It's in Amsterdam. I'm actually here in our office and we have our engineers. Well, I can. Uh, we'll, do, we'll do it for part two. We'll do, yeah, we'll do the, the part two inside the lab. Oh yeah, I'd love I'd love to go there and see what they're testing and how they're doing it, and, and like that fascinates me that 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 what you guys have discovered at Seaboro and what you're working on. To me, that is such a wonderful service to the industry because we've been flying blind, Doctor Krams. I'll be honest with mm -hmm. you, like as like somebody who like we're at, you're at we're at opposite ends of this industry. I, as soon as I get off the phone here, there's someone who's going to call me. He's going to say, I'm looking for an F-15 T4 for CW. It's 16 <laughs> inches long or whatever, right? And it's like, okay, I got this in stock. So, like, I'm a completely other end of the industry. And, and we, you know, I, I never even thought about that, that problem. I never even – it, it occurred to me that it was kind of awkward, but we just started selling them. And, boom, next thing you know, we're deploying uh, – and incentives come along, and you're just selling box after box out the door. And then, so you're doing a wonderful service at Seabro. I can't wait to do a part two with you guys. Deal? Great. Deal. Okay, Deal. good. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Thanks, Thanks, Thanks for Greg. having us. Yeah, yeah and folks, if you, made, if you made it all the way to the end, I got to tell you about our friends over at TCP Bank. Greg, they got a lot of tubes down at TCP if you're looking for T-LEDs, man. They do. And Ooh. interesting, now after this discussion, theirs is actually called Ultima. I didn't even put that together, but the Ultima T8 is their emergency <laughs> backup tube. <laughs> so I just hit That's me funny. here as I was reading it again. I'm like, okay. Um, I've heard that word before and it was in this podcast, but <laughs> their version is an emergency backup tube. So it's actually built into the tube itself. It has the uh, test button and indicator light right on it. So you bypass the ballast, put that in, and you've got an emergency fixture. Wow. Go to tcpi.com. Our friends Ellis and the crew all down there. We love you guys. And of course, the National Association of Innovative Lighting Distributors. That's right. Check us out. Join us. We're actually doing some research. That's right. We're turning our we're turning Nailed into a research organization as well. That's right. That's what we want to talk to these guys about on this show. We didn't get to it. But, of course, our thanks go to Dr. Mike Krames. That's right. Check him out. He's on LinkedIn, um, arkeso.com, and peter 6 seaborough.com. That's S-E-A-B-O-R-O-U-G-H.com. Kind of sounds like Scarborough, where I am right now. And he's also on LinkedIn. So check him out there. All those links are going to be on the Get a Grip on Lightning podcast. But if you've made it all the way to the end, listeners, viewers, all you people out there, we love you guys. That's right. Without you, we don't have listeners. We don't have viewers. We only have colleagues that don't do podcasts. We've said it a million times. Thanks for listening. Bye for now. <laughs> <laughs>